I always do. Um, so, good job. Uh, so, going a little further, this is week three, this is where we are. Your workbook four is due on Friday. This is the most difficult of your workbooks, okay? There's only like five or six that you have to do. So this is the third one you've had to do, okay? And it's the most difficult one. So look at it before class on Friday, is what I'm saying to you, right? You know, say Wednesday evening, Thursday afternoon, all right? Give yourself a little time. That's workbook number four. Also on Friday night, your thesis for Killers of the Flower Moon is due. It says it's right there too, okay? It's due by midnight. A thesis is a statement of your argument, okay? You can either read Killers of the Flower Moon or you can read Invisible Man. Both of these are historical books that deal with a lot of questions about uh, prejudice and stereotype, and they're both have really strong Oklahoma ties. Ralph Ellison's from Oklahoma City. Killers of the Flower Moon happens in Pahuska. Okay, they're making a movie about it. Yeah. Uh, and there is a prompt. If you go to, with the thesis, the prompt isn't there, but if you go to the assignment itself, there are three different prompts for killers that you can choose from and two prompts for invisible that you can choose from. And so look at the prompts, read enough of the book, I'm not saying all of it, but read enough of the book that you can write a sentence based on one of those prompts that's gonna be your thesis, okay? Why do I want you to do this? Any ideas other than torture? So you can think about what you're gonna write while you're reading the book. That's exactly right. And if it turns out that the thesis that you came up with turns out not to be a good fit for where you end up at the end of the book, you can change it, that's fine. I want you thinking about it though before you're reading it or as you're reading it, okay? All right, so um, then today, just a reminder, the questions for this lecture to help direct you and I use for your exams are up here, questions for them, right? They go along with the lecture. The whole reason is just to focus you. You don't have to turn them in, they're for you. But the point is, is if you're writing them while I'm talking, then you might look at it and say, for example, I don't get this, where did this come from? And you can raise your hand and I can say, oh, okay, let's direct a little bit and, and fix that, all right? And then the lecture itself is here. You can download it, which I'm going to do right there. And I'm going to talk about it. All right, so one other thing. Some of my fellows told me that um, you guys, a, a couple of people had said that you thought the lab was optional. It is not optional. <clears throat> Okay, you have to go, it's 5% of your grade, go to lab, okay? Uh, the other thing is this, masks, all right? You have to wear masks in class today, through today, okay? Next week, beginning on, or actually this week on Wednesday, supposing we don't have a snow day, oh good, another announcement. So I have another, I have another announcement. If we have a snow day, I'm going to put a Zoom lecture up of that day stuff just so you guys can see it. You don't have to log in in real time, but it's there for you, and that way we stay on course, okay? Um, but these first three rows, if you're sitting in the first three rows, or if you sit over to my right, I'm going to require that you wear masks, okay? And I am doing that for the people, the students who would feel more comfortable which is not to say, if you don't want to sit, um, you, don't, you want to wear a mask, but you want to sit over here, go ahead. I'm just telling you that these three rows and this section are going to be mask only. So think about that on Wednesday, okay? If you don't want to wear a mask, sit somewhere else, okay? First three rows in there. If on Wednesday we have class. <clears throat> if we <laughs> do not have class, there will be a lecture that you can look at. And also, if we have don't have class or if we do have class and then somebody notifies me that they were here and they have COVID then for the next two weeks we all have to wear masks yeah. I mean that's just these are the rules 
and I'm just telling you what the rules are so you know. Okay? You guys got it? All right. Okay. Um, is that all my announcements? Fellows, anything else I'm missing? All right. Let's talk about limited government. I'm going to remind you guys of the poll that you did on Wednesday. On Wednesday, you did a poll, and 24% of you and 38% of you, 24% of you said you were a federalist. 38% of you said you're more federalist than anti-federalist. So that's about 62%. That's actually a little lower than my normal amount, okay? Um, it's still more than 60%, um, but I would say I usually range from two-thirds to three-quarters, so you guys are a little bit more anti-federalist than federalist. Um, and then 38% of you are either more anti-federalist than federalist or anti-federalist. And it always comes out to that that anti-federalist is always absolutely the lowest, between 5 and 9% is where it hangs out. I talked in the very first class about democratic challenges. So I want to remind you guys about that. It is a challenge to protect individual rights and provide for majority rule. It's a challenge. And those of you who did the zombie apocalypse, when you're thinking about your governmental system, you recognize that. This tension between security and liberty. But as Benjamin Franklin said, those who would sacrifice liberty for security deserve neither. Right? And so when you think about it, is he saying there should be no security? No. One of the big questions when we talk about how to form government is what comes first, stability or liberty? Or how do you build them together? It's hard. Individual rights include speech, assembly, publishing, criticizing government. When I asked you guys in the very first poll that you did what you thought was most important to a democratic republic, you said that. That was your answer, over half of you. And then majority rule means that the group with the most votes gets to make governing decisions within the framework of the government we have, right? Within a framework of laws. Because majorities can trample individual rights. And another problem we have is that well-organized minorities can trample and subvert my majority will. What am I talking about, a well-organized minority? Who might I be referring to? Oh, money. Yes. Right? So the very wealthy. Right? If you have enough money to run PR campaigns, then you can convince people that something is in their best interest whenever it's not. Or you can finance enough campaigns to get enough people to vote things that you want and subvert the will of the majority. We're going to talk about public opinion at some point, and we're going to talk about what the majority of the people want. There's some seats down here if you want some. We also have another problem. Liberties without laws descend into anarchy. This is something you guys dealt with when you were building your system, right? Liberties without laws descend into anarchy. And that's also dangerous and unstable. In the Declaration of Independence, we talked about the fact that all men are created equal. And that governments are required through social contracts to provide life, liberty, and our ability to pursue happiness. And what was happiness again? What? What? Fulfillment. Fulfillment. Being all that you can be. Living up to your potential. Right? It's basically a Nike commercial. And injustice means not that we have a right to revolt, but that we have a duty. You need to wear a mask. Do you need one? There's somewhere over here. There's a box of masks right here. Injustice pe means people have a duty to revolt. Not a right, but a duty. It's a lot for a one-page document, don't you think? 
In a letter from Birmingham Jail, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. says, I am here because injustice is here. And injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Which is the same thing that George W. Bush says as reason for invading Iraq. This has become a tenet of American democracy. He also says that freedoms are never given freely by the oppressor, it must be demanded by the oppressed. Justice too long delayed is justice denied. He's talking about 90 years here. But I want you to think about 10 years, 20 years. If you're trying to resolve something and the court system, the legal system, is continuing to perpetuate an injustice, how long are you willing to wait? He also talks about the difference between just and unjust laws. What was that difference again? Unjust laws do what? What? Say it again. Go get the Constitution, okay, but something else. Okay, it gives an advantage to one group or targets one group unfairly. So it treats people differently. A just law treats people the same. An unjust law treats people differently. Okay? Remember, we also talked about the difference between the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. The Constitution is more elitist. They wanted the best to govern. The Senate, the President, the Judiciary are all either elected indirectly or appointed. The House was the only one that was directly elected from the people. <clears throat> it was definitely less radical. They wanted indirect consent. They wanted consent of the government, but you know, through a channel. Okay? <clears throat> so, you guys would elect three people from this class, and those three people would then elect, you know, which person would make the decisions. It emphasized stability, order, and slow change. So, while I talk about absolutely Martin Luther King Jr. talking about injustice and how justice too long delayed is justice denied. I also, it should be noted that within this system, it works slowly. You need a mask? The Constitution is going to reflect the framers view. Limited government, the rule of law over all, the Constitution, right? Is it within constitutional boundaries? Separation of powers from Montesquieu, protection of rights, both in the Constitution and by the states, and the majority rule, consent of the governed, and democratic accountability. The ability for us to reject those people in office in favor of someone else. <clears throat> All right, so um, let's take attendance. So get out your Cengage app, right? Click on the little three, the three little lines on the top, go to courses, select this course, 11, 13, 30, hit the attendance on the top. It says I'm taking attendance. I started taking attendance. Okay. You have two minutes, not three, two. We have some compromises in the Constitution too, and we haven't really talked about this yet. So I'm gonna give you guys a second to do attendance and we're gonna talk. You still have a minute and a half. 170 of you have checked in, good work. And it looks like 
243 of you have actually registered with the book. Since there are 250 of you in the class, that means seven of you, if you're here today, are a little okay, behind. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Sorry. So there are some constitutional compromises, right? The great compromise is going to shape state power. Madison proposed a system where there's direct election from the people to the House of Representatives based on population. Right? And then that body would elect the president. So there's still an indirect. And that body would, after the president had appointed, would confirm Supreme Court justices. So still indirect, some direct, some indirect. But if you'll note, where's the role of the states in that? In Madison's scheme, the states are bypassed. The Great Compromise puts states right back in it. Because we end up with a bicameral Congress. Half which are directly elected by the people by population. And then the other half come from the states. And it's two from each state. Is there anybody in here from California? Raise your hand. California, one. Two, three, three people from California. How many people are in the state of California? Way too many. Population. Population. 40 million. 40 million people live in the state of California. Anybody in here from Wyoming? Nobody's here from Wyoming. That's because Wyoming only has 500,000 people and they don't let people leave. <laughs> it's just a joke. But. My point is this, Wyoming has two senators for its 500,000 people, which is smaller than Oklahoma City, which isn't that big of a city. And California has two senators for its 40 million people, which means that in the Senate, Wyoming is represented 80 times more than California is. States have power because of the Great Compromise. In addition to this, we have a compromise about slavery. I told you guys specifically that the majority of the Founding Fathers, the framers of the Constitution, wanted to make slavery illegal, to abolish it. But they didn't. Why not? because they needed the South. They needed the South to sign on. And the result was this. People were counted as three-fifths of a person, which means they weren't people under this system of law. Right? And it shapes race relations to this day. To this day. Because those inalienable rights, we talked about the Declaration of Independence, those things that make us human, well, they were separated out. We also have a compromise regarding the executive. <clears throat> Basically, at a certain point, they stopped fighting about it and said, and Hamilton said, I'll do it. And they said, okay, go ahead, we're tired. And Alexander Hamilton, gave the executive lots of weird, vague power, okay? First of all, that state created the Electoral College, so that means states elect the president, people don't. That means states have power over the Senate, the president, and the president nominates justices that are confirmed by the Senate, so the judiciary, and people have what? Control over what? The House. And only the House. Your representative is your representative. If you say, I don't really like my representative, but you know, there's a senator in another state that I'm okay with, I want you to think about the fact that you don't like your representative and what you should do about it. Because you should do something about it. You should vote for somebody else at the very least. Right? The powers are unclear on purpose. Because Hamilton was like, yeah, 
you know, it'll be George Washington. He's my friend. And they were. He's like, and I trust him, and if he were king, that would be cool. And he would have been. But George Washington was a little D Democrat. And we're lucky in that. Because if he had had even a streak of the authoritarianism I heard in these zombie apocalypses, he would have been king forever. Because people loved him and they wanted him to be. And then when he died, what would happen? Maybe his son, maybe someone he appointed, but not somebody people chose. Right? Because George Washington serves two terms and says, I think that's enough because a president is not a king, it makes a difference. It makes a difference. So, political equality and the right to vote, that's left to the states. There's some states at that time, if you were a property owner and over the age of 25, you could vote. Right? And so there were women who could vote. There's some states where if you're over the age of 25 and a man, you can vote. You didn't have to own property. Within 20 years, that was the rule. 25 years of age, and we're a man. And so women had a little bit of suffrage, and then it went away, state by state, because it wasn't at the federal level. <clears throat> we also talked about the Federalists and Anti-Federalists, and I want to remind you guys of that. National power versus state power is something we still debate to this very day. I mean, you can't, you can't notice it. We're in a pandemic, and there is no consistent guidelines between any, <laughs> between any state, but I mean, from locality to locality, right? I mean, state power and national power are at conflict. Large and diverse nation is necessary to preserve rights, says Madison. Whereas Patrick Henry says, extended government leads to an end of liberty and self-government. What do you believe? Ugh. Right? It's a tension. Maybe both. And we argue about these ideas. And states clash with the national government over power all the time. They want that national government power and they don't want to tax their people because they want to get reelected. but they want to hold on to the administration. So who protects liberty? We'll talk about that next week. I'm gonna let you guys listen to, Pat, to uh, Thomas Patterson for a second. Um, he's a Harvard professor that I quite like. And uh, Eric's gonna hit the lights up there. I'm in Washington, standing in front of the Supreme Court building where in 2004, 2006, and 2008, the Supreme Court declared that the Bush administration had acted outside the law and had to stop. At issue were policies that Bush had put in place after the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001. Bush had concluded that the United States was engaged in a new kind of war that required a different set of rules. Captured enemy combatants, instead of being tried in regularly constituted courts, would be tried in secret military tribunals. Those that were thought to have important information would be subject to harsh interrogation, including waterboarding, which the United States had condemned as torture when used on American soldiers in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. In one case, the Supreme Court said that the Bush administration had violated the Constitution. In another case, the Supreme Court said that it had violated the laws of Congress and the Geneva Conventions. In its final decision, the Supreme Court rejected the Bush administration's claim that the President alone had authority to decide the rules of law during time of war. That judgment, said the Court, belongs to us, the Court, not to the President. The Supreme Court in those decisions was acting as the framers of the Constitution would have preferred. In the words of John Adams, the nation's second president, the Constitution was designed to create a government of laws rather than of men.
Century after the U.S. Constitution was written, William Gladstone, the four-time Prime Minister of Britain, declared it to be the most wonderful work ever struck off by the brain and purpose of man. Gladstone admired the Constitution for the precedent it set. The nation's highest authority would be the words of a document, rather than the dictates of a top ruler. Today we take that idea for granted, but in 1787, when the Constitution was written, it was a revolutionary idea. Elsewhere in the world, the law was what the king said it was. His word was law. America would be governed instead by a Constitution that put limits on what those in power could do. In this session, we'll look at why the framers of the Constitution were determined to limit the power of government. Then we'll look at how they built the concept of limited government into the Constitution. Finally, we'll examine whether the Constitution has actually served as an effective check on government. The American Revolution was fought to overthrow what the Declaration of Independence called the absolute tyranny of the British King. The framers worried that the U.S. government might itself become tyrannical. It is said that Benjamin Franklin, asked by a woman what type of government the Constitution had created, replied, a republic man, if you can keep it. How do you prevent government from becoming tyrannical? You might think it's a constitution that strips government of nearly all power. Some Americans today think that way. A U.S. Senate candidate recently ran on a platform that claimed, the government which governs best is the government that governs me. The writers of the constitution knew that, a lesson they had learned the hard way. When the American states declared their independence from Britain, they wrote a constitution called the Articles of Confederation. The Articles established a national government, but gave it almost no authority. It had no power to tax, but instead had to petition the states for money. The states were still to pay, and often paid less than their promised share. During one five-year period, Georgia and North Carolina paid nothing, not a single dime, to the national treasury. So think about your own finances. What do you do when you're short of cash? Well, for starters, you probably cut back on your spending. You're really desperate. You might try to sell your valuables. Well, that's exactly what the government of the Articles did. To save money, it slashed the army to less than a thousand men. To raise money, it sold the Navy ships. This is a time when Britain still had a large army in Canada, and Spain had one in what is now Florida. How would the country defend itself if attacked by Britain or Spain? No wonder that George Washington questioned whether the United States deserved even to be called a nation and worried that it would descend into chaos, opening the door to a tyrannical leader. Now, the Constitution was meant to fix the defects in the Articles of Confederation, but the writers were also determined that the new government not be so strong as to threaten liberty. So their strategy was to grant the national government necessary power, including the power to act while at the same time placing strict limits on its authority. This strategy included denials of power. Officials would be prohibited, for example, from putting someone in prison and throwing away the keys. This was a common practice at the time in Europe. Opponents of the king were locked away for as long as the king wanted, forever in many cases. That practice would be prohibited in the United States. The Constitution gives the accused the right to appear before a judge who will determine whether authorities have enough evidence to warrant detention. The writers also sought to limit government through grants of power. Article I of the Constitution, the very first article of the Constitution, gives Congress 17 specific powers, such as the power to tax, the power to raise an army and navy, the power to regulate commerce. These grants give power but they also deny power. Powers not granted to Congress, those not on the list, are denied. In a period of history when other governments admitted to no limits on their powers, this was a substantial limitation. As originally written, the U.S. Constitution did not include a Bill of Rights, a list of specific individual rights, such as freedom of speech. The framers thought a list was unnecessary because government had only those powers granted to it, and it had not been granted the power to deny people their rights. 
Thomas Jefferson was among the many who thought otherwise. Jefferson had included the Bill of Rights in the Virginia Constitution he wrote at the outbreak of the Revolutionary War, and other states have followed his example. Said Jefferson, a Bill of Rights is what the people are entitled to against every government on earth. In response to such objections, the first Congress passed a series of amendments that were quickly ratified by the states. These amendments, the first 10 to the Constitution, are called the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights is a clear example of limited government. If you were arrested tomorrow and had no money, the judge doesn't have the option of saying, tough luck, buddy. The government is required by the Sixth Amendment to provide you a lawyer and to pay. Now, the framers didn't think that words alone, written grants and denials, would be enough to control those in power. They wanted something stronger. That something was to divide the government into separate branches and pit them against each other. This was not a new idea. The French theorist Montesquieu had proposed it nearly a half a century earlier. Where there is no separation of powers, he wrote, there can be no liberty. But the framers gave Montesquieu's idea a new twist. Rather than completely separating the branches, as he had proposed, they overlapped them so that each was better positioned to act as a check on the others. So instead of granting all legislative power to Congress, they gave some of it to the president, for example, the power to veto laws, and some of it to the court, the power to interpret laws. The same with executive power. The president has most of it, but not all. For example, Congress controls how much money the president can spend and on what. The president doesn't have the option of taking money allocated for highways and spending it on the military. The same with judicial power. For example, by giving the president the power to nominate federal judges and the Senate the power to confirm them. This system of divided power was described by Harvard's Richard Newstead as one of separated institutions sharing power. The powers of government legislative, executive, and judicial are granted to separate branches, but no branch has all power within its sphere of authority. Part of it, in every case, is shared with the other two branches, providing them a means of checking that branch's power. So that's the theory, each branch acting as a check on the others. Now, as you know, theory and reality aren't always the same thing. The English poet John Lamont quipped, before I got married, I had six theories about raising children. Now I have six children and no theory. What about the framers theory? Well, the record is far from perfect. After Japan attacked US forces at Pearl Harbor in December 1941, President Franklin Roosevelt ordered the forced relocation of more than 100,000 Japanese Americans from the West Coast, saying they might try to help the enemy. They were forced to sell their homes at rock bottom prices and were shipped to detention camps in Utah and other inland states. They lived out the war behind barbed wire, washed over by armed guards. Their advocates looked to Congress for help. Instead, Congress embraced Roosevelt's policy. Not a single senator or House member voted to rescind. Three times, the Supreme Court reviewed the policy. Each time, it upheld it, though it was clearly unconstitutional. Racism played in the relocation policy. America had a long history of discriminating against Asians. Chinese were blocked from entry in 1883. Japanese immigration was effectively blocked in 1907. When the survivors of the Titanic arrived by rescue ship in New York Harbor in 1912, they were taken ashore, except for a handful of Chinese crewmen. They were not allowed to set foot on American soil. Ironically, Japanese Americans were allowed during World War II to volunteer for combat in Europe. They made up the entirety of the U.S. Army's 442nd Regiment. That regiment became the most decorated combat unit of its size, not only in World War II, but in the whole of U.S. military history. Twenty-one of its soldiers received the Congressional Medal of Honor, the nation's highest award. In 1988, the United States issued a formal apology for its mistreatment of Japanese Americans, saying it was the result of race prejudice, war hysteria, and a failure of political leadership. As the relocation policy indicates, America is not a stranger to tyranny. The powerful 
trampling on the rights of the weak. Such episodes, however, are relatively few in number, and the system of checks and balances is a reason. Scores of times, the President, Congress, or the Supreme Court has intervened when another branch has overstepped its constitutional authority. The Watergate scandal is a textbook example. On a June night in 1972, a security guard at the Watergate buildings in Washington, D.C., noticed that the latch on the door to the Democratic Party's national headquarters had been taped over. He removed the tape and went away. Coming back later, he noticed the door had been taped open again. He called police. They caught five men inside, installing bugs in the phones and ceilings. As it turned out, they had links to President Richard Nixon's re-election campaign. Nixon denied that anyone in the White House had knowledge of the break-in. In truth, the Watergate break-in was part of a much larger dirty tricks campaign aimed at guaranteeing Nixon's re-election. The dirty tricks included wiretaps, tax audits, burglaries of Nixon opponents, paid in part with money laundered illegally through Mexico. A turning point occurred when during a Senate investigative hearing, a White House assistant revealed that Nixon had tape recorded all of his Oval Office conversations. Nixon had first refused Congress's demand to hear the tapes. As the pressure mounted, he released transcripts of what he claimed were all the relevant ones. When Congress demanded more tape material, Nixon refused. Congress then filed suit to get the tapes. In a unanimous decision, the U.S. Supreme Court, which included four Nixon appointees, ordered Nixon to turn over the tapes. They were incriminating. Nixon was heard telling his assistants to cover up the Watergate break-in, including using the CIA to block the FBI from investigating it. With that, the House of Representatives began impeachment hearings. At that point, Nixon resigned, the first and only president to do so. President Nixon, despite holding what is often called the most powerful office on earth, was powerless to stop Congress and the Supreme Court from acting. The writers of the Constitution had established them as separate and independent branches of government, and they acted in precisely that way. Now, as I'm sure you recognize, America's system of checks and balances doesn't always operate that decisively. Politics is a rough and sometimes deceitful game. What if the Watergate burglars had not been so stupid as to get caught? Would Nixon's illegal action have been discovered in time to do anything meaningful about it? Presidential secrecy is one of the major threats to the effectiveness of America's system of checks and balances. Congressional secrecy is not a problem. Congress has 535 members, and they couldn't keep a secret of the tribe. The presidency is different. Presidents have the loyalty of their assistants and can sometimes withhold potentially damaging information as occurred during the impeachment of President Donald Trump. During the inquiry, Trump refused to let White House officials testify at House hearings and block them from turning over documents to House investigators. Now, a different type of threat to limited government is illustrated by the federal government's detention of Japanese Americans during World War II. In that case, all three branches thought a breach of the Constitution served the nation's interest in time of war. There's another threat that has shown itself to be important. It can be seen in the situation we discussed earlier, the Bush administration's anti-terrorism policies. As mentioned, the September 11 terrorist attacks convinced the Bush administration that the war on terrorism required a new set of rules. The rules for handling enemy captives were hatched in secrecy to keep them from scrutiny by Congress. They were also kept secret from those in the administration, including Secretary of State and former Army General Colin Powell, who would have objected. Slowly, information about the policies leaked out, in some instances through news stories, in other instances through legal cases being argued in federal courts. As the information came out, there were calls for congressional hearing, but almost none were held. Even the Supreme Court rulings in 2004 and 2006 against Bush administration policies did not prompt Congress to launch high-profile hearings. Then, 
in 2007, the number of congressional hearings increased dramatically. Why was that? Why was Congress initially slow to scrutinize Bush policies, but then suddenly eager to do so? As you might have guessed, the answer is partisanship. Very good. Through 2006, Republicans controlled the House and the Senate, and thereby controlled the scheduling of hearings. They were not at all interested in holding a Republican administration to account for its policies, knowing that it would hurt their party. Things changed abruptly after Democrats swept the 2006 congressional elections and took control of the House and Senate in early 2007. Democrats now controlled the hearing process, and they called one hearing after another. Seeking partisan advantage, they were keen to grill the Bush administration on its war policy. That situation arose again in 2019. During the previous two years, when Republicans controlled the House of Representatives, Russia's effort to tip the 2016 presidential election in Donald Trump's favor was the subject of relatively few hearings, and the issue of the Trump campaign's contacts with the Russians was the subject of even fewer. But when Democrats took control of the House in 2019, the number of hearings multiplied and the inquiries probed more deeply, including whether the president had unlawfully tried to obstruct the Russia investigation. Okay, let's wrap up what we've said in this session. As we noted, the Constitution was designed in part to provide for limited government, meaning a government not so powerful as to threaten liberty. The Constitution contained various controls on government, including grants of power and denials of power. However, the key mechanism is the separation of powers between the three branches, the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. The powers of the branches are overlapped so that each branch can more effectively act as a check on the others. The system doesn't always work as intended. It weakens when, as in the World War II relocation policy, the three branches are united in thinking that the national interest is served by ignoring the Constitution. It weakens when a president succeeds, even for a time, to keep unlawful actions secret. And it weakens when the presidency and Congress are controlled by the same party. Then the majority party in Congress might seek to play down the issue. Although the U.S. system is not a perfect check on power, the record also shows that on many occasions, dozens and dozens of them, it has helped to rein in abuses of power. We'll never know, of course, how U.S. history would have differed if the Constitution had not been based on the system of checks and balance. But the fact that some leaders have tried to operate outside the law suggests they would have done so more readily and more outrageously if the other branches had been powerless to check their actions. There was a great deal of wisdom in what John Adams said in a letter to Thomas Jefferson. I say that power must never be trusted without the check. Okay, is that a quick poll? Can you hear me? Yeah, there it goes. Is that a quick poll? Which limits on government are most important? I'm gonna put that up there so you can see it up here, but I have started the poll. You have two minutes. Which limit on government is most important to you, right? Not to me, to you. Denials of power to government, grants of power to government, Bill of Rights, separating institutions, sharing power. Reminder, if we do not have class on Wednesday, I'll post up a lecture.